Welcome to the Atlantic Council's Live from COP, and we are here in the green zone at COP28. I'm Jennifer Gordon, and I'm the director of the Nuclear Energy Policy Initiative at the Atlantic Council. And I am so thrilled to introduce the Honorable Catherine Huff, who is Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Energy at the Office of Nuclear Energy at the U.S. Department of Energy. Dr. Huff, welcome to COP. Thank you so much, Jennifer. It's really nice to be here. Wonderful to have you here. Um, let's dive right in. Tell us a little bit about the Biden-Harris administration's priorities at this COP, especially on nuclear. Yeah, I think, you know, DOE-wide, we're highlighting a lot of initiatives, whether it's earth shots or fusion energy or our collaborations on net zero world. But in the context of nuclear, we're really excited to be part of this three times nuclear pledge that I think really underpins what it means to say how far we are away from what we need to hit net zero by 2050. I think it's critical to measure the difference between how much capacity we have today for firm, clean power and how much we're going to need in order to have net zero in our hands, in reality, in 2050. And that is going to it's going to mean three times as much nuclear capacity as we had in 2020. We're going to need in 2050. And that's the pledge. And I think, you know, that's probably the biggest nuclear initiative inside COP uh, right now. But in addition to that, I was really lucky and honored to be able to announce that myself, uh, along, you know, ourselves in the USA, along with Japan, France, the UK and Canada uh, are part of a group called Sapporo 5, which is, of course, the group of five nations, uh, which alongside the G7 meeting in Sapporo announced that we really would like to expand conversion and enrichment capacity for uranium sufficiently to displace Russian supply and untrustworthy supplies in general. So we were able to announce some numbers associated with that pledge. We're collectively aiming to pursue $4.2 billion or more by three years from now. So in the next three years, we will be investing a great deal from these countries. And it was a really big announcement for us. So we're really excited about it. Uh, finally, you know, we had a, an announcement of a clean energy training center with the UAE under the PACE initiative. Well, congratulations on all of those achievements. And it really sounds like the work that you're doing here is intended to build out a full nuclear energy innovation ecosystem. And so it's the reactors on the one hand, the fuel, maybe the financing um, and other elements that all go into these efforts. And it seems, too, when you're talking about this scale up, we need to start thinking about the reactors, not just in terms of ones and twos, but also tens, hundreds, maybe thousands. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when we think, you know, beyond gigawatt scale reactors. If you think about small modular reactors, it takes three or four of them to get to a gigawatt. And if we're talking about tripling nuclear capacity in the U.S., that means 200 new gigawatts between now and 2050. That's either 200 gigawatt scale reactors or 600, 300 megawatt reactors. Well, 600 and a little bit. Right. And so we do start thinking about nuclear scale up in the thousands. You can put your finger on it exactly in terms of financing. I think some of the most interesting conversations from this COP have been around how we mobilize development banks, how we mobilize private industry, who I would love to join us in our pledges, uh, in particular pledges around the fuel supply, which so impacts their interests. Um, those financing conversations, I think, will be, in retrospect, the most imp impactful. Amazing. Um, so at the Atlantic Council over the last few days, a number of us have started taken to calling this the nuclear cop, because it also seems that nuclear is moving closer and closer to the center of cop. What's your experience been so I far? I mean, I can't disagree with that. I think there is absolutely more nuclear here than I've seen uh, in any previous COP. I've only attended another COP, but of course I pay attention and it really hasn't been part of the conversation in the way that it is here. I think in part that's probably related to the leadership of the UAE in their successful deployment of the Baraka plant. They went from, you know, 20 years ago having no civil nuclear at all to now having a significant amount of their electricity provided by these four units out of Baraka. Three of them are operating, soon the fourth will begin operating. But, you know, I think we're really pleased when we see a new nuclear nation join this really important group. Absolutely. And speaking of new nuclear nations and bringing new um, people into the fold of nuclear energy, yesterday was Youth Day. So can you tell us a little bit about who you engaged with, the kinds of conversations that you had? Well, as a former professor, uh, I think you may know that I absolutely love interacting with younger people, folks who have, you know, a lot of spirit about them and the nuclear advocates that were brought here. You know, I understand the UAE and the World Nuclear Association, a handful of others have supported 
over 60 youth advocates to come here and be present at COP. And I think youth advocates around nuclear energy are really energized to see it be part of the renewables and clean energy conversation, to be, see it be part of the climate mitigations that we need. And I had some really good conversations with them yesterday. They have some really good sort of show and tell at the booth that's a sort of nuclear needs net zero booth in the blue zone where you can sort of, they were explaining nuclear fuel to non-nuclear people. I thought it was incredible outreach, really focused on facts and education, technical leadership and, and trustworthy, high integrity individuals. We're all here from all kinds of different countries and they're the future, you know. I look at these people and I wonder, you know, is this going to be the next CEO of their nation's nuclear utility? Is this going to be the next director of their nation's national laboratory? And I think the answer is absolutely yes. You know, in particular in nuclear energy, where we do have a bimodal distribution of age, there are a lot of older folks and a lot of folks under 35. And there's a big dip in between, actually, just because of the timeline and pace of deployments. And those retirees are coming and that big gap is a real danger unless those young people fill some really big shoes. Big leadership positions are coming for them, and and I have high hopes. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to engage with them, and I'm sure that you were very inspiring and that they loved hearing your story as well. Um, what is next for COP? So next year, COP29, what are you looking forward to? What should we be trying to achieve between now and then? Well, I think we are going to need to really make progress on the order book for new nuclear. As we think about nuclear, a critical component will be making sure that we have enough orders on the books for specific locations with specific constructors and operators and vendors with customers ready to go so that, you know, that supply chain doesn't have to be overbuilt. We need it to build quickly and start tomorrow because otherwise, if we wait until 2049 to build 200 gigawatts of reactors, then the whole supply chain has to be 12 times as big, 20 times as big. And instead, we really need to get started so that the rate per year of reactors that we have to build, the rate is feasible and manageable. The longer we wait, the more unmanageable the rate of building is going to be. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have, but a great call to action for us to end on. Um, thank you so much for spending time with us today at Live at COP. Thanks for having me.